Cannabis have been around for quite some time, but only in the last 20 years have they come to North America and Boy, in that 20 years, lots have changed. They're getting immensely more popular. You see a lot more commercial gyms using it. A lot more places sell kettlebells. There's a lot more kettlebells education. And, you know, people are stopped calling them kettleballs now, which is a nice touch. So, yes, they're very popular in the strength and conditioning circles. But what about... just realize I'm not wearing my wedding band. You'll make it. You'll make it without it. <sighs> that feels better. Where was I? Yes, they're really heavily used in these strength and conditioning circles, but what about in the clinical setting? So for somebody like myself who sees patients who are maybe injured or we're trying to get them to perform in a certain way, well, how is that used in there? Because oftentimes when you see something like in strength and conditioning, you're talking, you're, you're talking about somebody who's like well. So we say like, you know, on this line that we have right here, somebody is well. And if we want to get them to perform a lot better, you know, we're going over here. But oftentimes in my particular case, we're seeing people who are unwell. So we're starting below this curve to get them back to normal and then get them to perform a lot better. So. You know, we know kettlebells, or they're heavily used now anyways in kind of this area, but what about in this area? This is what this article aimed to help us uncover. Woo! So this article, Kettlebells in Clinical Practice, a scoping review. So a scoping review, by the, by the way, is a little bit different than something called a systematic review, which is a type of study where, you know, a systematic review where we say like, okay, we have this hypothesis, let's go into the literature and extract all the articles talking about this, kind of combine them together and answer this question that we have. Well, a scoping re review is a little bit different. This is when we have not necessarily a hypothesis per se, it's kind of getting a lay of the land. And this article does a really great job of getting a lay of the land and kind of getting a general idea of like, okay, where does the academic literature stand right now with regards to kettlebells? So there is a bunch of articles that they uh, reviewed in this particular paper. And what I wanna do in this video here is essentially do a quick overview of some of the key results that they found in this particular study. So it's not gonna be in depth necessarily on any specific point. It's more meant to be a rather fast paced video and I highly recommend people read this article in full to get a more in depth understanding of what's out there. Link is in the description below. So they categorized us in different ways. They looked at acute profiling and long-term. So acute profiling, basically a lot of times studies just do a quick test, not quick test, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying. They do a test and then they see the results right away. Then you have some more long-term things. This is when you, you get somebody to do like a four week or six week training protocol and then you see effects from that. So that's the difference between the acute profiling and the long-term type of profiling. So we're gonna go through this rather categorically, kind of more or less kind of the same flow that it did in the article, but again, I'm not going as in depth as they, as they are in this article. I'm not gonna go over every point because I really wanna try to get the points I can you know, explain in either one or two sentences. And then right after I list out the result, I'll give my quick take home point or interpretation or way that we can use this in our setting. So please again, read the article below. So without further ado, Acute profiling, now surface EMG. Surface EMG is when they're actually looking at the amount of muscle activity that is going on under the skin. And we're gonna go through these articles now. And I'm gonna use my phone because I haven't memorized the, the entire article. Turkish getup provides roughly equal mechanical challenge to both shoulder girdles. For more on this particular paper, my paper, click the link right up here. So with all types of swings, we tend to see more medial versus lateral hamstring activity during the swing, and you see more of that activity during the two-hand swing. The medial hamstrings are working harder than the lateral hamstrings, and the two-hand swing works it more. Now motion analysis. This is either looking at the joint segments or the kettlebell trajectory. So experts and beginners perform the two-hand swing differently. So we see experts tend to lead with the hips, then the shoulders, and on the downswing, the arms drop first and then the hips hinge, versus the beginners tend to do the opposite. They're leading with 
the shoulders going up and then the hips are going down and then the hips start to hinge first and then the arms follow on the downswing. In other words, experts use a hip hinge strategy versus beginners using a squat strategy during the swing. In kettlebell sport, hey, with the 32 kilogram snatch, the trajectory of the kettlebell was fairly consistent between individuals and highly consistent within the individual, meaning that each rep that the person performed looked pretty much the same as the previous rep and the next rep. Some of the reasons that they hypothesized that there was a difference between people were anthropometric reasons. So some person might have really long arms, somebody really short, vice versa, things like that. So basically, Everybody's built differently. So when you are coaching the individual in front of you, take that into account. Not one cue or one technique matches all. The overhead swing on unstable surface had overall less range of motion than not on an unstable surface. You know, yeah. And we may see a small trend in decreased range of motion when novices who normally swing with lighter bells use heavier bells. If you increase the weight of, of a kettlebell that somebody's using, you know, technique might change a little bit, it takes some time to get accustomed to it. So again, pay attention to when you are coaching an individual and you're bumping up the weight, They're going, her technique might change a little bit in response. So take that into account. Hormonal response, very limited data overall. Now we're looking at mechanical demand. The vertical breaking force with a 24 kilogram kettlebell was reported to be approximately 25% greater during the downswing than the acceleration on the upswing during a two-handed hard style swing. Probably even more if you had the trainer just slap the kettlebell down during the downswing. Looking at performance now, which a lot of people are interested in, of course. So the two-handed swings with a 16 kilogram kettlebell for a minute was enough to induce fatigue defined as reduced in torque production in the lumbar extensors, your back muscles, but way less than an isolated lumbar extension exercise. Seems legit. And using a kettlebell weight of approximately 20% of your body weight for either swings or jump squats did not affect your counter movement jump performance. Shocker. The cardiometabolic response. So at a matched RPE, rate of perceived exertion, if you had somebody swing a kettlebell for 10 minutes versus them running on a treadmill for 10 minutes, the kettlebell group had a significantly lower VO2 and cardiometabolic response overall. So if the goal is to have more of a cardiometabolic cardio response, go on the treadmill. It seems. So 12 rounds of two-handed swings produce significant mean increases in heart rate with each successive round and significant post-exercise hypotension and 30 minutes after exercise. More swings equals higher heart rate. So at a controlled work rate of 20 two-handed swings at a pace of about 40 swings per minute and 10 sumo deadlifts performed every minute on the minute versus continuous cycling on an ergometer at 80 RPM, no significant differences were reported in any physiological, subjective, or metabolic response. Basically, all roads lead to Rome. So next one here is exertion testing. Now, oftentimes we use, uh, in my setting, we use exertion tests to determine or have a reliable idea of where their VO2 max is without, you know, hooking them up to like, you know, the big fancy machines that cost a lot of money. So there are a lot of protocols out there that use like a treadmill and a graded increase in pace and incline. And once the heart rate reaches a certain point, that's when we can help use that as a surrogate marker for determining what their VO2 max is. Now, there are some studies that look at doing either a kettlebell snatch set or something like that, where they're trying to use the kettlebell protocol to help see if we can use that instead of the, the treadmill one. Maybe because kettlebell is significantly cheaper than buying a treadmill, of course, but what seems to be happening is that uh, it's not quite the same. The treadmill is a lot more reliable as we can see uh, in the uh, literature right now. Probably because, in my opinion anyways, of course, the kettlebell snatch involves a lot of skill. So we might be getting more of a muscle fatigue first before it's an aerobic fatigue with the kettlebell snatch because there's also a lot of skill that, that's involved versus just walking on a treadmill. So if you're doing exertion training, better to use the treadmill tests. So with respect to modifiable factors of swing cadence, bell weight, and rest periods, increases in kettlebell weight or cadence were reported to significantly increase cardiometabolic response. So if you increase the weights or go faster, you work harder. Yeah, next category. Now we're going through the long-term stuff here. This is where we're 
like I mentioned earlier, somebody is using a more longer term protocol, for instance, we're looking at the results after a more of a long term test. So here we go. <coughs> Physiological response. 15 weeks of training in individuals with Parkinson's disease showed significant improvements in time up and go, sit and lift, elbow flexion, and lower limb strength and torque measures compared to the non-periodic activities group, which performed potty building and stretching exercises. That's pretty cool. Women with sarcopenia training with kettlebells showed improvements in grip strength, back strength, and sarcopenia index, and were even sustained fairly well even after four weeks after stopping kettlebell training. Also very cool. Now performance improvements. So a basic low volume, low intensity program of kettlebell swings performed twice a week resulted in a large reduction in reaction time to perturbation and had relative reductions in pain uh, that they were feeling at the time as well. So basically, kettlebells can help you be more reactive and also help with pain. Hashtag exercise is medicine. So a group of individuals using a kettlebell hard style circuit from twice a week for eight weeks in young, healthy, active participants had the improved in trunk endurance, uh, improvements in dynamic leg strength, uh, balanced leg press strength, small improvements in grip strength, yada, yada, yada. Cool. Kettlebell swings using a kettle clamp was reported to increase power and strength when compared with explosive deadlift training. It doesn't. Now, unfortunately, limitations in study design make it so that we don't know the exact effects that kettlebell training has in performance in things like uh, football, handball, hammer throw, or the military fitness training. Shucks. Injury and rehabilitation. So this is stuff I'm really interested in. Now the papers. And that's my daughter. So injured and rehabilitation. So this last category that we have here. Now, if we look at the rehabilitation one, most of what we see here are essentially case reports and case reports are essentially just when the clinician has a patient, they go through the whole uh, rehab protocol with them. And then there's a, the clinician decides to write up the report and publish it. So then other clinicians like myself can read that and say, oh, okay, that was a good idea and how you use kettlebells and incorporated kettlebells in rehabbing their low back pain or how you used it to rehab a shoulder, things like that. As far as research quality goes, this is kind of like that bottom rung essentially of a research. And when you compare it to things like higher up, like if like you look at a pyramid, for instance, so on the top of the chain, you might have something kind of like a Cochrane review versus the bottom ones are the, these expert opinions or case reports. But basically in order to get to this top level, you need to have these ones down here established. And this is just where we are in the research right now, because again, kettlebells are still fairly new overall. So the fact that we have more case reports and less of these higher quality ones is not surprising. The educated clinician can still read these and make an educated decision when it comes to implementing kettlebells with a patient in front of them. So thank you for all these individuals who are publishing case reports or just, you know, publishing as a whole. So please continue to do that. It helps all of us. And now we're actually looking at injuries sustained with, through kettlebell training. So there's three different injuries. One is decurvanes tenosynovitis, which is basically some of the tendons over here getting a little bit injured. A radial stress fracture. Again, most of these are probably due to the improper clean technique. So the clean is just the bell is just kind of slapping right onto the forearm there. And the last one is a rhabdomyolysis. So basically somebody just kind of overexerted themselves and got a little bit too much muscle damage. And these injuries are likely due to training load error. So when you're training with kettlebells, make sure you have a coach. Whew. Yes, come in. Hi, honey. Come here. You have boots? Yay! Come inside! Look! Does it look nice in here? Look, my beautiful phone. Your beautiful what? My phone. Your phone? Here. That's my phone. My phone. This is my phone. <laughs> so thank you very much for what? So thank you very much for So thank you very much for what?
So if you're new to this channel, thanks very much for being here. I really do appreciate it. Here is a playlist of three more videos of mine that I think you would enjoy. So until next time, um, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go make my daughter breakfast now. Okay, Ellie, breakfast time.